we're thrilled to offer a special panel discussion hosted by the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. Through our partnership, Embark and Westminster together are committed to promoting the importance of health and vitality for every unique breed. This panel, Collaboration is Key, How Breeders and Veterinarians Shape the Next Generation of Healthy Dogs, was a natural step in that partnership as we work to put our joint missions into action. This session will be live broadcast to the Westminster Kennel Club Facebook page at WKC Dog Show and to Embark's breeder dedicated page at Embark for Breeders. If you're not already following these pages, they're a great source of information and news, as well as a way to engage directly with various leaders in the canine health and canine sports communities. Again, that's at WKC Dog Show and at Embark for Breeders. So I'd now like to introduce our moderator, Ms. Gail miller Beischer. Welcome, Gail. Hi, John. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. I've got a, a little bio here, and we're, we're thrilled to have you host this discussion. Happy to be here. All right. So, so Gail miller Beischer is the Westminster Kennel Club's Director of Communications, Spokesperson, and an on-air analyst for its iconic dog show. Gail is an AKC licensed dog show judge and is a member of the Dog Writers Association of America and multiple national breed clubs. She is passionate about dogs and an advocate for canine health, and she brings a wealth of experience from years working with dog owners, breeders, handlers, and helping to produce one of the world's foremost canine sports events. Please join me again in welcoming Gail. Thanks, John. All right. Really excited to be here. And now we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We have a great lineup today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Ryan Boyko, who is the uh, Embark founder and chief executive officer. Ryan founded Embark after a decade spent using novel analytic approaches to tackle tough questions in public health, ecology, and industry. And Embark was founded to bring the critical insights obtained from this research to dog owners and to unlock the potential of big data to improve the lives of dogs and humans all over the world. Every day he lives Embark's mission to end preventable disease for dogs. Thanks, Gail. And next I'd like to welcome Larry Lecce, who is a small Hi. and, sorry about that. Larry Lecce, a small animal veterinarian. Dr. Lecce has a special interest in small animal reproduction and puppy wellness. He enjoys working with a variety of breeders in his practice. He, along with his wife, Lori Carlton, actively breed and show Bichon Frise under the kennel name of Bell Creek. Their top achievement of their Bichon Frise is Flynn, grand champion Bell Creek's All I Care About Is Love. Flynn was the best in show winner at the 2018 Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. Larry and Lori have finished dogs to their championships from all seven AKC groups. And the last in the panel today, uh, please welcome Justin Smithy. In addition to being a breeder of whippets and Italian greyhounds, he is a professional handler and the owner of a boarding kennel. Justin is the proud breeder owner of the top winning Whippet in AKC history. That's champion Pinnacle Kentucky Bourbon, who you may recall won Reserve Best in Show at Westminster in 2020. Bourbon and her litter mate, champion Pinnacle Tennessee Whiskey, are the only litter mates to have both been ranked number one hound in the US and also the only litter mates to both win Best in Show at their national specialties which is, as we all know, a huge feat. Now, to, to start the uh, webinar here, I just want to remind everyone that this year at, will be the 145th Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show, and the dogs you'll see on TV didn't happen overnight. There's been over 100 years of trial and error with breeding programs, and lifetimes of learning have been gained and passed on by thousands of dedicated preservation breeders. But every breeder works with a vet, all the way from a routine vaccination to emergency C-sections. And breeders, of course, have an expertise in the breeds they love, and vets have canine medical health expertise. So. Well, let's kick it off by asking Larry, who is a breeder and a vet. Larry, how do you recommend vets and breeders work together to better support our breeds and the generations to come? 
Well, both um, veterinarians and um, the breeders have got to form a, a uh, relationship that works for both of them. It's very important. I think the most important thing that both breeders and veterinarians can do is listen to one another. Each one has an expertise in their specific area. And by listening to one another, they can make the best decisions that are best for both of their dogs. Right, and as an educator, you also teach at veterinary uh, college, I believe. And so um, what, at, what do you think can be improved upon at that side of it? Um, I teach sometimes at the at Michigan uh, State Veterinary uh, University College of Veterinary Medicine. When I went to school many years ago, we lacked a lot of um, information on breeds and genetics. I think that Unfortunately, in veterinary medicine, we have to learn so many different breeds and there is not enough uh, time to learn everything that you can. But I would hope that or as time goes along, that each veterinary college will start to teach more about um, canine reproduction. They will also put much more emphasis on the genetics of dogs. Um, each particular university has a particular curriculum, and I think it's important that the curriculum is very wide and broad and it can cover as many aspects as possible. And I would hope that as time goes along, um, there can be more um, coordination between um, veterinarians, veterinary colleges, and breeding programs, uh, you know, uh, such as AKC, Westminster, et cetera, to make it a much more um, important part of a general uh, practitioner's um, education. So Ryan, Ryan, I know that you're talking to the vet schools regularly as well. Is there something that you've heard um, on your end about adding more reproduction to the curriculum? Well, it's my brother is the one that actually teaches at, at vet colleges and uh, or at, at Cornell specifically. Um, but uh, you know, we've given a few talks to at different vet colleges um, where we've been invited, and I'll say that you know the reception there has been has been overwhelmingly positive, and you know really gotten a, a high percentage of students to come. To the events that we've hosted and and a really engaged um, students and and in many cases uh, faculty members where there is a lot of interest in what we do and, and just in general about genetics and the advances in in science and a you know a recognition of the importance that it can play so I think um, on the the student side I mean these are all students who as undergraduates took a number of classes in genetics um, and, you know, learn what, what's happened on the human side, um, you know, what's happened in, in other animals. And I think, um, you know, there's just a, a lot of interest from young and training veterinarians about how they can, you know, apply this in their practice and, and take um, the profession, you know, to the, to the next level. Right. So Justin, as a breeder, um, you have expertise in your breeds, as we said earlier. How do you think you can work with your vet to advance your breed long term? How, how do you think that that can um, be improved upon? Well, I think with tools like embarking is going to be really more helpful than anything because that's sort of how you can plan breeding and know that you're avoiding negative situations by doing those kind of tests on dogs as well as other things like echocardiogram, looking at hips, and evaluations like that on breeding stock. And you've got to have a veterinarian to do those kind of things. So they're an uh, integral part of it. Yes, we know that um, once you do find a, a vet who works with you, it can be uh, a relationship, a very close relationship. You rely on each other. So I think that um, a lot of breeders know that it, sometimes it can be difficult to find uh, mm -hmm. the right vet to work with you. And But once you do, it's so helpful to your, to your um, breeding program and helping the next generation. So I, I wonder if there's a way that we can um, educate the vets to know how much they, what an impact they have, whether if, when they say they're not interested in working with a preservation breeder, what does that, how does that impact the dog's future lives? 
Well, I, I mean, you can't <laughs> make without the veterinarians. You have to keep searching until you have someone willing to work with you. And it is unfortunate that there's a large portion of veterinarians that are not interested in helping breeders. And they've, you know, there's a lot of residual business that you could get by helping breeders, not just with that one customer, but then the people that buy those puppies for companions or show dogs would also rely on them if they're in the same region of the country. Yeah, I think puppies is a great topic, actually, because um, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, the breeders are selling the puppies to, to new homes. And then, of course, the vets are going to be the new first relationship you have as a new puppy owner. So how can that be that relationship and that touch point um, maybe be helped if, if puppy buyers are educated about genetic health and why it's important? Yeah, I think I think the vets do re do rely on the breeders. Even currently, a lot of people that we have that we've sold dogs to, if they have a question, they'll say, "You should ask your breeder. Is this something in this breed?" Which is very encouraging to have a, a buyer come back and ask you that their veterinarian has asked them to, you know, bring to your attention because it's useful for as you move through the, the breeding program, what the questions and things that come up with a puppy are. Mm -hmm. And Larry, did you have something you were going to say? Yeah, um, the, the most important thing that a breeder can do is provide as much information to the veterinarian as possible. Um, there's a wide range of information that um, breeders will provide about their breed or about their dog when they bring in their initial information. It's much more than just having what vaccinations the dog has had. I have some breeders that will bring me just one simple page written, and I have other people that will bring an entire book with the entire history of the dog, the um, the, the pedigree, the um, all the genetic tests going back, um, you know, five, six, seven generations. And I think it's um, very important that um, the veterinarians spend the time and the more information that we can get, the better off it is for not only that puppy, for puppies generations later, um, for the, the overall health of the dog. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, let's see, someone has uh, asked a question and let's see, they want to know about alternative and holistic and chiropractic So I think it's, um, I think this was for you, Larry, alternative and holistic um, medicine for dogs. Is that something that vet schools are starting to embrace? There is more and more of that going on as time goes along. Um, I refer regularly to um, veterinarians. Uh, if my clients want um, the alternative medication um, rehab centers, there's been a tremendous growth in um, alternative uh, aspects in veterinary medicine, where there's now even veterinarians that are board certified in um, rehab and chiropractic work. Uh, and I gladly will refer someone, especially if that's what they want, because it's to the benefit of the dog and to the owner's uh, overall well-being for their dog. Hmm. We have another question really quickly here about um, spaying and neutering, particularly at a young age. Uh, it's asking, is that something that, um, how can we get vets to not do that is what someone is asking. The, st the standard for years has always been that a dog should be spayed at six months of age. Um, that was just what was traditionally made as part of our veterinary education. All rescue groups are now spaying pediatric animals at a young age. What I do is I very much listen to when the uh, puppy buyer brings the dog in, I ask them, I said, our standard is, is six months, but uh, if a breeder recommends something to their puppy buyer, that it's better that this animal um, is older uh, or that there's been problems by doing them at that age, it's most important that the veterinarian um, uh, follow that directive because they know what the, the, the breeder has provided this information information uh, that we may not know about a particular breed's benefits for waiting on something to be spayed. Right. It's mostly just following the directive on, on what you're presented. It's most important to be flexible um, with any aspect, especially something such as Spain. Thanks, Liz. 
And then just getting back to um, what we can do as breeders when we go to our vets to make our dogs' lives better. Let's say you get your Embark DNA test results and you're thinking about breeding that dog and then you decide to go talk about it with your vet. I know that Embark offers genetic help and has a hotline, of course, but if you have a close relationship with your vet and you wanna go and talk to them about the results, um, some vets I'm sure are really um, skilled and well-spoken on the topic, but some may not be, right? Sorry, who's the question directed to? I think we're all- anybody. I'm sorry, I'm just throwing it out there for whoever wants to respond. Well, I, I certainly can't speak from the veterinarian's perspective, but I will say we do provide, you know, as you had mentioned, not only for owners or breeders who get, you know, who buy a test for us, um, uh, uh, the ability to, to, you know, contact and talk with one of our vets, um, particularly if there's troubling results. But, you know, we also talk to veterinarians sometimes when people bring their results. And, you know, that's something that um, we do. And, and we are, you know, working on building more educational tools. Um, you know, we built a continuing education module too um, for veterinarians. Um, you know, so, so I do think it's a real issue. It's, it's one that takes time, uh, like, like anything, to, to really get people um, get veterinarians um, comfortable with with these new tools, and and that's certainly part of our responsibility as well. Um, but we always encourage people to to share their results with their own veterinarian too. Um, as Larry was saying, it's a you know, it's holistic care, right? It, it's about the whole the whole animal. Um, genetics, while they can be very important. In guiding certain parts of care, um, aren't, aren't everything right? And it has to be, it has to be done in context with with the whole animal, their entire you know history. Right. We have a question um, for a breeder. I'm going to ask um, Justin to answer this one. We have a question that is: How do you manage breeding dogs with a potential genetic problem that has a late onset presentation? Well, it's hard to see the future, so it really depends on what that is. There's so many different things, like a cardio issue might be a late onset, so you're doing every other year an echocardiogram. There's types of PRA that are late onset. I think you, the key to that is knowing the pedigree and what the dogs on both sides are at an elderly age and when they've seen that come up, and that is really how you can manage it. I mean, if it can be managed, I mean, you don't. If both sides of the pedigree, the sire and the dam, if they've got parents then at an age that it's going to be coming on to them and you see that that's going to be the case, you wouldn't want to double up on that. I mean, you want to bring that in as little as possible. I mean, you're going to have to take that into consideration no matter how much you want to do that kind of breeding. You don't want to double up on those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's one, one good thing about having dogs that are still tested even at an older age. I mean, we've had dogs that are in their teens getting their hearts checked to see where they stand, even if they're not breeding at that age. Right. Well, it is, um, that kind of goes back to the point earlier that, you know, genetic testing and health testing and health screening is something that uh, goes on throughout the dog's lives. And that's something that <laughs> breeders are very dedicated to, but how can we, get the new dog owner um, acclimated or uh, <laughs> understanding that it is something to help the dog's life, whether you're gonna breed it or not. The more education and the more information that's provided from the breeder to the pet owner and to the veterinarian, the better off that is. Um, many breeders are very skilled at giving, it, it's just information, information, information. Anything that you can provide um, helps everybody make a better dog. Right. That's great. I have a question here um, about genes. So hold on, Ryan, this might, this will be for, for you maybe. Can you say a few words about, let's see, 
the yet to be discovered gene that apparently activates uh, the cause of DM. How does this unknown factor impact using a dog who tests as a who tests as having two copies affected, especially in a breed that is very rare and lacks genetic diversity? Yeah, uh, that's a great question um, and uh, a fairly common one. We in fact use the term at risk instead of affected, uh, partially to acknowledge that a lot of these genes don't have what's called complete penetrance. You know, the, the, the genetics, or at least what we know of the genetics, don't entirely determine what winds up happening. And, um, you know, as with, with a, a lot of things in life, it is a balancing act. And um, certainly knowing your own line and knowing your own breed are very important when you have, um, you know, conditions like this, where it's known that the, the factor that increases risk varies uh, between breeds, almost certainly varies between lines, um, how likely it is to actually lead to a clinical disease. Um, and so we would, uh, I, I think it, it, for people who are watching uh, Adam's talk, you saw that reductions in, um, or increases in, in inbreeding, reductions in diversity in, in that sense, um, lead to very real impacts, um, you know, can kind of cause a dog to age uh, about two years faster, lose two years off their lifespan. So, um, you know, if you are in a breed uh, with a very low prevalence of DM, even in dogs that test with having two copies of the allele, uh, and you are not, you're breeding a line that has never had DM, even though a lot of the dogs have had two copies of that allele, um, you know, I, I would say that that shouldn't, you shouldn't be breeding only dogs, um, you know, trying to create only clear dogs and restricting your gene pool for um, something that seems to carry very little risk in those lines. Now, obviously you should keep paying attention, stay in contact with uh, everyone who gets your dogs and, um, you know, so that you would hear if, if that changed. But um, I think that's the practical advice for a breeder now. Um, and of course, if you do uh, test with Embark, we strongly encourage you to fill out those those health surveys, and you know um, you can share ownership of the profile too with the the pet owner for the dogs that that you um, sell or give to somebody else, and um, and encourage them because ultimately uh, we hope that we can find some of those genes, which will one um, allow for breeders to have that information when they're making breeding decisions. But two, you know, then you can actually try to target um, bringing those protective mutations in the lines that, that don't have the protective mutation um, and, and potentially into breeds that don't have the, the uh, protective mutation where you, you know, you have another way to fight DM. And, and ultimately, in some cases, um, understanding the action of those protective genes can lead to therapeutic advances, too, which can... Um, you know, might be helpful even for, for dogs who develop the condition, potentially of, of all breeds. Great. Well, I hope that that, well, that was a very thorough answer. I think she's, <laughs> I hope she's happy. All right, I learned we now, something. <laughs> we now have a question for the vet. That's you, Larry. Uh, most Dalmatian owners cannot find a vet with knowledge uh, about the urate stone issues. Uh, is there anything we can do to instruct the vets and uh, help them learn? What is it? Hold on. Something switched. Anything we can do to instruct our vets of this issue um, without them taking offense? Also, um, most are against the raw diet, which many Dalmatians do well on. What are your thoughts on raw diet and the stone issue? Um Something that could be very helpful would be to um, bring the information from your breed club. Each breed club has their own um, health committee. Uh, and by providing the information from the health committee, uh, because obviously Dalmatians have a problem with, um, you know, the urate stones and it's, important to provide that information to a veterinarian because we're taught something we're taught extensively about that issue as far as the raw diet itself um 
we have specific formulas that are formulated by um, specific companies to prevent the, the, the reoccurrence of those stones. But there also are very good um, uh, recipes to make your own, which is in a formulation in a raw diet. So there are good advantages to using both the commercial diets. And if there is a diet that someone has had success with, it's very important that that is provided directly to the veterinarian so that they can educate themselves and they can educate their other Dalmatian owners. That's great. And of course, you know, working with your breed club makes a huge difference because there's a sharing of information, sharing of uh, the different lines. You have all kinds of information. I know Embark works closely with the breed clubs to help them collect data and, and be able to know more about that breed when they have lots of samples brought in. Um, Ryan, along that, let me ask you really quickly, there is um, our if breeders are conducting health testing not found on OFA, can or should that information be submitted to Embark to keep track of for research? Thyroid, for example, we uh, test full panel each year or in between breedings. Can you explain the annual health survey? Yeah, so there's a, a few questions in there. Let me start with the last question uh, on the annual health survey. Um, so, the, the annual health survey is, serves a couple of, of major purposes um, for, for our research. And so one of them is serving as a, a, a place to find, um, for lack of a better word, research leads. So, you know, you get um, data submitted from, you know, 100, 000, on 100,000 plus dogs. Um, and even when that that information isn't um you know the the actual veterinary records let's say right where you're going to get um the exact diagnosis and the you know and, and and in many you know many of these studies that that um people do ultimately you do imaging studies you do all you know all sorts of studies to get a really definitive diagnosis but the health survey lets us take data on a far larger number of dogs than we would ever be able to take to a, a, you know, a, a research uh, center veterinary clinic, um, you know, like they have at Tufts or Cornell or, or those kinds of places. And, um, and, and it lets us find where we, we are, uh, you know, where we have a likelihood of getting um, results if we dive deeper, right? And it helps us know which dogs in our, that we've tested would be the dogs that we would want to follow up in and we you know we can engage those owners more closely to then ask about you know actual veterinary records that they might be able to upload or you know potentially um other testing that that um you know we could ask them to do or or those kinds of things um so you know that's that's kind of one purpose and then the the other purpose is collecting um health data over a time series for dogs, um, you know, this is something um, for for those. Some of you might know the Framingham Heart Study, right? Was started in the 1960s. It might have been 50s or 60s. I'm trying to remember now. But um, you know, and and followed people born in Framingham for their entire lives, um, and and did this repeated um, surveying and testing. And it's been a huge treasure trove. Of learning about these diseases that that appear over over somebody's life, and what are the things that precede them, right? How can you start predicting them, and then you can start to understand the biological processes that occur. And again, it helps you generate hypotheses, ideas, to test. and um, and and so it's really really beneficial to get this data on the same dogs every year for their lifetime, and that's. You know, as we do this for a number of years, the power of that data set is going to, you know, be unmatched to anything else out there in order to make uh, a lot of these advances on these these late onset or chronic conditions that can appear. Um, so, so that's really the idea behind the annual health survey. Um, we always encourage people to submit any any information they have, especially if they think that it's information that might be be relevant because of what else that they've seen before in their lines what they've you know seen in their breed um you can upload documents to your profile um we 
We do, um, you know, if there is a particular kind of issue, if it's a thyroid issue, something like that, that is common in your breed or is emerging in your breed, one of the absolute best things you can do is to try to work with your, your breed club or at least just getting a group of breeders who agree that this is something they want to focus on together and being able to approach us because uploading the documents is great. We'd love to have them to, to, to be able to refer back to in the future. Um, but if we, if we see that there is enough interest um, and that there's probably some kind of a there there, we can um, you know, design an actual survey um, for that breed um, and share it with just w dogs of that breed, sometimes including mixes, sometimes not. Um, that, that then can really tackle that issue because, you know, the problem with it, it's great to get those uploaded documents. We can always use them in the future, but in order to, to, you know, run the analyses, you have to have a database that, you know, has structured data, right. In the same format. And so if something is a problem in a, in a breed, um, that allows us to, to capture that data in a way that's really useful for research. If we can, you know, talk to that breed club or, or kind of a, a large enough group of breeders that, that have enough dogs to be able to, uh, to do that research. Great. All right, going back to puppies. Um, <clears throat> many breeders test their puppies before they go to new homes. How early can I test my puppies? Um, Justin, when you, at what age do you start testing dogs? We usually are testing the dogs that we've kept for ourselves. So you're, you're breeding from dogs that are tested to begin with. Um, we're, the puppies are going in for just a health evaluation by our veterinarian before they go to new homes, but we're not specifically doing any DNA testing, but we do do quite young testing on dogs that we are retaining for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I do know from my own breeders that I've gotten dogs from, they've had done uh, hearing testing and different testing at a young age, very young yeah. age. So Larry, what are you, what are your years? I mean, it, it, that basically depends on which particular um, disease you're dealing with. The most important, the most important ones probably um, that I come in contact with, with some of my breeders would be the hearing testing like you did. And also um, um, having the eyes uh, checked, uh, whole, certain breeds have have specific um, diseases that show up with the eyes at a much younger age. So a lot of my breeders, uh, especially like collie breeders and um, some other breeders, will take all of their puppies into a veterinary ophthalmologist to have them tested at a very young age because those are the specifics that, you know, uh, we see the most would be hearing and eyes are the ones that are, are done the most frequently. Yeah. And I'll just add that in, in the genetic test, we've, we've looked at this and, you know, from a week old on, um, as long as they haven't been nursing for a half hour or so before you swab, it's, it, you know, it works just fine. Great. All right. Let me, we're switching to COI. Here we go. What is the difference between genetic COI testing versus pedigree based COI research when picking a breeding pair? Anyone? I know you want that one, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, the, the pedigree COI is, is an estimate, right? It's a estimate of, um, you know, you aren't exactly 50% related to your sibling. You're 48% related to one, 52% to another. It's all, you know, uh, um, it, it's a chance process uh, over the genome. And um, so that's, that's one issue is if you look at a pedigree, you'll just never know that. And if that pedigree is going back for dozens of generations of related individuals, those add up, all of those chance thing, uh, differences add up. Um, and we can see in, in um, you know, we can see widely, you know, fairly widely varying numbers um, between, if you're picking from a, a sire from multiple potential males, even from the same litter, you know, with another, with another female. Um, and um, so that's one issue. And then the other issue is just that all pedigrees end at some point, even if they go back a very, very long way, at, at some point they don't go back anymore. And, uh, you know, what we found is even if you're going back into the late 1800s in some cases and, and doing all of that math, you're still missing that those dogs um, that were found in the breed, those dogs that were early on in the breed, almost always were related to each other. 
And so you're, you're also missing that. Um, so it's more work to do it by hand and you get a less accurate result. And, um, you know, and those compound on each other. Okay, back to the vet relationship. We have um, a breeder saying that vets don't understand breeders. They think that they're only in it for the business. Um, how can they? How can we help them recognize the importance of purebred dogs? Uh, and how can we better work together? And um, I think that kind of goes back to what we had started with. But but Larry, what do you think? When it, I would think if someone comes in with a puppy and has that stack of paperwork that you were talking about that has all the information, it would seem that that they got it that puppy from a responsible preservation breeder who does health testing and knows you know their lines. And if I'm the vet, I would think, oh, this is serious. This just isn't in a backyard breeder trying to make a buck. You know, this is like someone who's really studied the breed, the breed and living it, you know? So um, how do most, how would you think a vet would respond um, with the different types of dogs that come in from different types of breeders? It, you know, it just depends on the individual veterinarian. Um, it's, it's, it's hard as a veterinarian um, because we see a whole range of breeders. We see the good, the bad, and the ugly, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, there are a lot of bad breeders. There's a lot of good breeders. And that's why a lot of veterinarians have become um, anti-breeding would be a good way to describing that. They've seen the, the bad stuff. I cherish the great breeders. I love the good breeders. They make me happy. When my when my clients come in and tell me, especially new ones, that their 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 puppy won their class, I am happy for them. I just relish it. Even after doing this for 36 years, I find dealing with breeders is is fabulous. Unfortunately, it's a hard thing. If the, the breeder or the person that goes in and finds the person turned off, it's just like when I've changed my own vet, I changed my own doctor. There's, there is times where you have to change the veterinarian. You have to change what you do. You have to find that one person. It takes time. It's hard. Um, but there's nothing more rewarding than being able to um, get somebody to have all their genetic testing done, help them with their litter, and then see those puppies back. There's nothing more fun than seeing a whole litter of uh, 10 puppies come in the door and those puppies you know it, it cats are the same way I, I love kittens too i have some cat breeders um it's just a rewarding experience you need to find somebody that's that's um just enthralled by it and is happy with it it's it's hard to give it a concrete answer on that but if you're not happy with the way it's done there's many other veterinarians out there find a breeder vet um there's lots of breeder vets out there those are the people that are going to be do, that live it eat it um pick up poop every day i mean that's part of my life and it's just a great part of um being in the, the sport of purebred dogs yeah and i think uh we had talked um earlier before we started about ways that new people, new puppy owners could find a good a vet who's a breeder vet. And it might be, first of all, going to your local dog club and finding other, you know, people in the fancy, people that are breeders and in, in your area and asking who they use and who they have tried before and who they found to be um, a good fit. Yeah, there's a, there's at, at any dog show that you're at um, in any region of the country, there's going to be veterinarians that are showing dogs. Um, the best thing to do is ask other breeders, um, ask who you use, what you like, what you don't like. Um, I even have people that um, uh, I've had new breeders come in and they've said that the only reason I'm coming in to see you is I want to interview you. Um, it's, it, I will gladly interview someone. They'll bring a dog in or they'll bring something in and they've interviewed me. Some people may have not been happy, but I, that's how I gain a lot of people. I say, sure, by all means, we can spend the time, uh, as long as we're not in the middle of an emergency or something, um, go interview the veterinarian. Um, and if they're hesitant to do that, then you, you seek somebody else's advice. Right. So Justin, I'm assuming you have a longtime vet that you've been working with. Um, yeah. Tell us about that relationship. Well, I, I think it's the most important relationship you have as a breeder. So whenever you've got someone, you have to really cherish them and uh, try not to take advantage of them by 
wasting their time. I mean, you, you'll have lots of things come up over the course of a, being a breeder that you desperately need them. So don't just waste them with the trivial things. And I think when you have that kind of relationship, they're very responsive and they know whenever you need something, you really need it. It's, it is a special relationship. Once you find the right, you know, the right fit, that is somebody that um, you'll have generations of dogs come and go and end their lives. And, you know, you, you're there with that vet, that partner, really. It's really a partnership. It's very much, yeah, partnership. Mm -hmm. All right, let me get another question here. Uh, someone's asking about how do you get involved with the health survey, Ryan? Well, uh, the best thing to do is, is if you're an Embark customer, you'll, you should get an email that uh, lets you know when it's available and you can go online and, um, and, and fill it out. Um, and then, you know, encourage, especially if you are a breeder who has, um, you know, clients that has puppies that have gone to other homes, uh, if they have Embark profile, you know, certainly encouraging uh, other people or, or posting about it in, in your Facebook groups with other breeders is all helpful. Um, you know, and if you're asking how do you get involved in the sense of, you know, uh, helping uh, surface things that, that seem to be becoming a problem in your breed, um, you know, again, you can reach out to us at breeders at embarkvet.com, um, you know, let us, let us know um, and, you know, we're always keen to, to find, um, what breeders are interested in, what they're seeing. Um, and, and again, you know, it, those are extra impactful if you talk to other breeders in your breed and you're, you're seeing a lot of breeders with the same concern, then, you know, it, it can really make it rise to the, the level where, where we're actively looking at it. Okay, back to uh, raw diet. Someone else, another raw diet question. Um, what are your thoughts on the raw diet? I mean, I guess, uh, Larry, how do you handle that when someone comes in and asks you, I want to do a raw diet, I, I have the recipe, can I, or I can buy it now, you can buy, you know, pre-made, pre I guess. But um, what do you, what is your general answer when someone comes in asking that? Well, I've used commercial dog food all of my life and I've had great success. Um, but there are a lot of people that do use the raw diet. Um, I have to tell a story about raw diet so that people can understand. The most important about raw diet is making sure that it's prepared properly. I had a uh, one of my families uh, have uh, they were feeding raw chicken wings to their dogs and the entire um, family ended up in the hospital with salmonella. So my most important thing is using a commercial raw diet uh, is probably more beneficial than preparing a lot of things yourself. If you pre prepare things properly and you make sure that you have a balanced nutrition and they're adding all the vitamins and mineral in at the right particular aspect, um, then that's good. A lot of people do not know how to do that. So seeking the advice of a veterinary nutritionist might be beneficial if you're going to prepare your own um, type of raw diet. I would um, seek the, the help of a veterinary nutritionist at a veterinary college. Uh, would be a good way to continue forward. Okay. And now to teeth, we have another genetic question about hypodentia, dental faults impact a lot of breeds. Is this suspected to be genetic? Ryan? Um, yeah, I, I am, I'm, I'm going back and thinking about all the conversations I've had with our great uh, geneticists uh, uh, who who are uh, more trained uh, in the veterinary sciences too. And um, yeah, I think that there is uh, an element where, where there's heritability um, and, and differences between breeds in what you see, um, you know, what, what you see generally when a condition has a genetic impact. Um, you know, certainly there are uh, dental issues that are related to, to some of the changes in phenotype that have, led to the creation of different breeds. Um, you know, so there's some of that, but I, um, I do believe that, that there seems to be an, uh, the heritability to impact uh, uh, to suggest that there's a genetic element. Mm -hmm. Great. 
And let me go here. Your experience, successful breeders. So it's Larry and Justin, you can take it. You know how to select puppies. How do you balance phenotype versus genotype? Go ahead, either one. Larry, do you want to take it first? Have Justin go first. How's that sound? <laughs> you, go, you go first, Larry. I want to hear yours first. <laughs> Everything is relative. You had, I guess the best way of putting it would be um, I take everything into I take everything into balance and I try to select um, the particular aspects and try to improve each particular aspect if i have a dog lacking in a front i will want to go to a dog that has a better front um if i have a dog that is lacking in coat i will go to a dog with a better coat so i don't necessarily go by you know phenotype genotype etc i go by the overall attributes of the entire dogs uh trying to provide um the best breeding program i guess that's the way that i've always done it with the success that i've had yeah, that's that's really the way I feel too. I look at the individual for any breeding and also for puppy selection. So, when you're picking a, a pairing, we're looking at what can most complement each other, and then in picking the puppy out of that pairing, you're looking for the puppies that are excel in what you were looking for whenever you did that original breeding. I love Justin's answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> Okay, if your breeding pair tests clear, what's the advantage of testing the puppies? We've heard yeah, that so there's a, a few answers to that question. <laughs> um, so one of them can be um, peace of mind of the, the people who are taking that, that puppy home if it's not yourself. Um, if it is you, um, you may be interested in their genotype for different traits. Um, for example, um, and you may very well be interested in their inbreeding level and how, you know, you can, it, it's not only just about the inbreeding of that one dog, but if you have a sense of, you know, you, you want to keep one of these two males as a future sire and you have, um, you know, you already have an idea of a dam that, that might be used, um, you can actually see what the average, uh, COI of their potential offspring would be and, and potentially choose whichever male was going to um, lower that, you know, if they're, if they're both have the other traits that you're looking for. Um, and then, you know, of course, the other one is a perspective help where, um, you know, you never know what new conditions we'll be able to test for in the future. Uh, and you never know what conditions any given dog will develop. And so when you test the dog, you have the chance potentially um, to get results from from new tests that are developed in the future, and you have the you know potential to help um, advance uh, science in the future. You know, especially if, if one of those puppies comes down with a, a condition later on in in life. Um, so there's potentially some benefit to the, the the puppy owner, potentially some benefit to the breeder if they're choosing between dogs to, to keep and um, certainly some benefit to, to science um, if you go that direction. Great. All right, we have another question about the annual survey. Is there a way to transfer Embark results to puppy owners so they can participate in the annual survey? Yes, you, you absolutely can. And there's a couple different options for how you do so. You can either completely transfer them or you can have a, there, there's a kind of shared ownership feature. Um, there's FAQs online about how to do it. You can email us um, or, you know, to, to get, get all the details. But, you know, right there in the profile, when you go into the dog, there's ways where you can add e either add a shared owner or transfer um, ownership of their profile. And then this is, um, I, I think we all know the answer to this one, but does Embark have breed statistics available for breeders? Yeah, um, so we will be putting into the report, reporting soon um, some of those breed statistics. Um, we also have been developing um, breed reports, um, so you'll be able to, to keep an eye out. Um, I know that we've released a few of them to to a few breeds, but we're we're looking at um, being able to 
make them systematically um, from the data so that we'll be able to cover, you know, potentially all of the breeds. Um, but uh, so, so yes, um, and we love to, to share that back to breed clubs, uh, many of which have, have been helpful to us in sharing the word of what we're doing, um, share them back to breeders so they can see how that, that relates. Um, and by the way, for inbreeding specifically, when you get that result, um, your dog's result, it, it actually helps you visualize where in where how that corresponds to the overall breed inbreeding as well um in particular and that's you know the, those figures are drawn up directly from from our database and updated as we update the database um I just wanted to say, I think it's kind of great um, I, as far as what the future holds uh, for um, purebred dogs, especially with the work of Embark and the other geneticists. Um, it's nice to hear all of that because I think that's a, a great um, aspect for our future. Uh, the future just looks that much brighter with genetics, especially with the work that they're doing. And here's a related question. It says, vets are busy. How can I best inform my veterinarian that genetics is important to me? I guess having a discussion with them, right? Yeah, talking about it is the best thing. Unfortunately, we are very busy. Um, it's, it, we're all busy. We're all leading busy lives. And um, there's some times where it's just, it's, it's just can't be done at that particular moment. And um, allowing the veterinarian to analyze the information and getting back to them at, at a later time or scheduling a specific time uh, with a specific appointment to talk specifically about that would be a good idea. And we have a question for uh, the, the panel in general. How do we uh, counter the public perception that purebred dogs are not healthy? Uh, Ryan, what do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a, a great question. And at the end of the day, I think the best response is always uh, kind of in in a company parlance, it's not a marketing solution, it's a product-led solution, right? It's a, the best thing to do is to um, encourage the community of, of, you know, good dog breeders who, who care about the health, uh, you know, creating healthy dogs, as well as great companions, great champions, um, to, to, to do so in providing more tools so that, um, you know, you can counter the perception by having it not be true, and and also telling people how it's not true, um, and it's very you know it is the case that um, there are lots of lines of dogs and and you know a good number of breeds of dogs that are um, that live every bit as long and and healthy lives as many mixed breed dogs do, um, and you know so the the short answer is you're never going to convince somebody that. Um, I, I hate to pick on anybody, and I, I, I'm going to pick on them because I, I really love these dogs uh, a, a ton. But you know, you're never going to convince people that Bernie's Mountain Dogs are as healthy as your average 30-pound mutt, as long as you know you have a lot of Bernie's Mountain Dogs dying of cancer when they're seven, eight years old, right? Um, and and so the only way to combat that is is you know by breeding the uh, and research in, in that case. Now, there is the additional element that there are people who have incorrect perceptions. So, you know, in, in some cases, there are correct perceptions that I think you have to beat by, you know, it's a slow process, but of, of um, you know, improving those dogs' health. You also have the incorrect perceptions, and I, I think that that is something that we can... Um, it, it, it's just a lot of voices, right? I mean, you... The people in this audience, I'm sure, um, and the other panelists can speak to, um, you know, th there were people who have been actively trying to uh, harm the perception of purebred dogs for uh, decades now, right? And I think what I've been seeing, uh, as I've talked to a lot of breeders and, and do uh, purebred dog enthusiasts and a lot of people who love their mixed breed dogs and, you know, who even work in, in shelters and things like that, I have seen, in my own impression, a bit of a thought relative to what it was like 10 or 20 years ago, 
and and I think that it's a lot of work to continue that that thawing. But but certainly as an individual breeder, um, focusing on the health of of your dogs and your lines, and then being able to to make statements about how healthy those breeding dogs are and what you do what you are doing in terms of, yes, in terms of genetic testing, but also in terms of other kinds of, of health testing, in terms of monitoring and all of that for your line is, um, is, is how you combat that to, you know, people who are interested in your dogs. Um, education and public service announcements, uh, the work that the AKC does, the stuff that Westminster does on a regular basis, get all that information out there. Um, the more the more that we provide, the more that we get out to the public, um, you, you know, the breed clubs, everybody, they just need to take a, a stand and they need to present that information in a public forum. Um, and that's the only way we're going to overcome uh, the obstacles that we have. It can be it can be difficult to to change those perceptions for sure. But um, we just have a little bit of time left, so I definitely want to uh, end here. Where if you have any, I, I was just going to mention though quickly that you know uh, what you guys are doing too at Westminster and um, you know and in, in the AKC and other organizations as well. I mean, I think is also going a long way, right? Um, you know, what I've, what I've seen is individual breeders and also a lot of these organizations really being willing to go a little bit outside the traditional comfort zone and, um, and carry these messages. Um, and I think that that's been, ex you know, extremely helpful. And I, and I think, you know, we can simultaneously improve the health of, of purebred dogs and um, help people understand where their perceptions haven't been right. Right. And, and of course, now we have more tools than ever, right? There are more tools to help, um, you know, to put in a toolkit. So um, that, that also helps having, having some science behind us and having uh, partners in canine health, uh, which is something Westminster is very uh, dedicated to uh, promoting is canine health and well-being. So that's something we, we all share together. You see, I think we could take one more. Um, could Embark put together statistics of the percentage of purebred versus mixed breed dogs and how many carriers are affected for different diseases? So that's someone looking for even more, I guess, uh, something else to substantiate. Yeah, and I mean, we've looked at, it, it, it's interesting, I'm not going to dive deep into the details. Uh, Adam would be happy to talk about this for an hour or more himself. Um, but, um, you know, the answer, the, the, the top line answer is yes, we've looked in, into it. And um, it very much depends on the type of condition and, and inheritance it is. Um, in some cases, purebred dogs certainly have a higher... Um, level of, of genetic diseases and in other cases they don't um and um it kind of yeah it varies yeah right well we all know that vets are so important they really um you know are critical as justin said earlier it's a critical relationship between breeders and and their vets and and you know sometimes we all want to do the right things for these dogs but sometimes it's slow to change but hopefully working together and trying to educate uh the public and the veterinarians about preservation breeders and uh and the tools that we now have and, and can make a difference in this relationship and make it a stronger connection do you have any other last minute uh advice for for breeders and working with their vets Larry? Just work closely. Listen. I've always said that listening listening um, helps more than anything else. The veterinarian needs to be open. The breeder needs to be open. And the best practices, um, there's, there, that relationship can be uh, fostered for years. I'm on third generation people at this particular point that are show people that are bringing their puppies in. And it's something that just needs to be fostered. You just need to be open to new ideas. You need to be open to change. You need to listen. 
and just move forward as best as possible and work together. Working together is more important than anything else. Justin, any last minute? I think if you've, if you've got a veterinarian that is not willing to work with you, then you really do have to find another veterinarian because it's, it's too important of a relationship to just make do with what is the closest to your house. I mean, if you've got to drive a little further, people don't mind driving all the way across the country for a dog show. They should be willing to drive a little ways to find a veterinarian that they're happy with. Great. Well, it's all about improving the relationship, right? Yeah. For the betterment of the dogs. Okay, well, thank you a lot, Gail. This has been great. Yes, thank you all. I think that is, uh, we're at the last 30 seconds here, but thank you so much. I really appreciate having such seasoned breeders here of top winning dogs. It's really important that that people can hear what your experiences are. And of course, Ryan, we're thankful to you for hosting this entire uh, health summit. Yeah, um, and again, thank you uh, both for the institutional support from Westminster, uh, as well as, as your personal support. You've been uh, one of our greatest champions for years now, and, and I really appreciate that. All right, well, thank you again, Gail, for moderating such a great discussion. Thanks for having us, John. I think it was really uh, informative, and I hope it helped several people. Yeah. Oh, undoubtedly, more than more than several. Um, as you <laughs> saw, there were there were uh, there were many many comments and questions uh, posted. You you managed to get through just some of them, but um, it's really what this whole you know Canine Health Summit is all about. We're trying to bring together the people who can make a difference in dogs' lives and have a meaningful discussion about it. Um, so, so you, that, that was really informative. We, we appreciate it again. And thank you to you as well as to Dr. Larry Lecce, Mr. Justin Smithy and Embark's own Ryan Boyko. Thanks for having us.